Which brings me to tonight's speaker. The Czech author Milan Kandira once wrote that the struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. And I think it's fair to say that Jeffrey has spent his life and dedicated his immense intellectual talents to winning the battle of memory against forgetting. He is without doubt one of the most successful and inspiring human rights lawyers alive today. He has been a counsel in many landmark cases in constitutional, criminal and media law in the courts of Britain and the Commonwealth. He makes frequent appearances in the European Court of Human Rights. Almost all his cases are historic, but they include helping to prosecute General Pinochet of Chile and helping to defend Julian Assange of WikiLeaks and Salman Rushdie, to just mention a few. He's also served as a UN appeal judge at its war crimes court in Sierra Leone. He's the author of several groundbreaking books. These include Crimes Against Humanity, The Struggle for Global Justice, published by Penguin, and a memoir, The Justice Game, which has sold over 100,000 copies. I actually just bought one on Amazon today, so it's 100,001, I'm happy to report, Jeffrey. <laughs> My favorite of his books is actually one of the lesser known ones, The Tyrannicide Brief, the story of how Oliver Cromwell's lawyers produced the first trial of a head of state, that of Charles I, and it traces the career of the courageous radical barrister who devised a way to end the impunity of sovereigns who declare war on their own people. And you can see why I'm particularly interested in that book. He's also the founder of the Doty Street Chambers, the UK's leading human rights practice. He is here tonight in part because of his latest book, An Inconvenient Genocide, which is a devastating critique of the use and the abuse of history by those who would deny the reality of the Armenian Genocide 100 years ago. And of course, Jeffrey and Amal Clooney recently represented Armenia at the European Court of Human Rights. He's an implacable enemy of denialism and a champion of human rights. And for a man who needs no introduction, I've already given a very lengthy one. So without any further ado, let us release Jeffrey from his chair, bring him to the lectern. Ladies and gentlemen, the indomitable and indelible Jeffrey Robertson. Thank you for that overkind introduction. On the 22nd of August, 1939, when Adolf Hitler summoned his generals to his villa at Obersalzburg, a few days before they were to attack Poland, he made a shocking and brutal speech that you've been reminded of tonight. He urged them to show no mercy because who now remembers the annihilation of the Armenians? And they went into Poland, you may have seen on films, the Blitzkrieg, you will have read of the killings of the Jews, believing that like the killers of the Armenians 20 years before, they would have impunity the very same impunity that has covered the perpetrators of the Armenian genocide for rounding up the intellectuals and community leaders on the 24th of April and later, killing the able-bodied men either in labor battalions or at the beginning of the conscription period, able-bodied men meaning boys over the age of 12 and leading, forcing the deportation of the old men, the women, and the children. They may not have used gas ovens like the Nazis, but they used death squads and starvation and typhus and concentration camps in places we've only heard of today because they're occupied by ISIS, places beyond Aleppo. And they tried to destroy Armenians as Christians, many of them were killed to cries of Allah Akbar, but eliminate the Armenian problem, the Armenian question, as Talat, the main perpetrator, uh, put it to Morgan Powell, the American ambassador. And they passed laws. We have 
the best evidence. We've got the laws that they passed in 1915. First, the deportation laws to force the Armenians, all those in Western Armenia near the Russian border, out of their homes and their lands and their churches. And then we have the appropriation laws that were passed later to ensure that they would never come back to those homes and lands and churches because uh, they were occupied or destroyed. And they were called in the great, one of the great euphemisms of genocide. It was called the law of abandoned property. Property was not abandoned. Uh, they were forced out and forced to their death. There is, uh, as you've been told, this interesting historic link uh, between the landing at Gallipoli on the 25th and the beginning of the genocide by the rounding up of the intellectuals in Constantinople, which is now, of course, Istanbul, on the 24th. On the 24th, my relative, Grand uncle was huddling in a boat, a British Australian boat, about to land at Gallipoli the next day. <laughs> he, he did land. I don't think he lasted more than 24 hours. He was shot in Sniper's Alley by a Turkish soldier. And I asked myself, and I wrote the book because I asked myself this question. What do we owe to those who were killed in war, like my granduncle, and those who were killed under cover of war in a war crime? My uh, uncle, Piper Bill Robson, who played the bagpipes, uh, had volunteered to fight. And he was killed lawfully by a Turkish soldier defending his own land. And I don't think that we owe him any special mourning a century on, other than a sadness at the futility of war and perhaps an anger at the politicians of the period, those stiff-necked and stupid political leaders who took their countries to war and refused for four years uh, to uh, Hold, have a peace agreement despite the massive carnage. But the million or so Armenians who died as a result of those massacres and deportation were in any view victims of a crime against humanity. So uh, should they be remembered a century on uh, just as victims of war like my grand uncle? Or do they have a special claim on our memory and on our thinking of how to avoid such atrocities in future. Of course, this has become a hot political topic. Here in America, Barack Obama in 2008, as he was campaigning to be president, said, I quote, the Armenian genocide is a widely documented fact supported by an overwhelming body of historical evidence. The facts are undeniable. Elect me as president and I will recognize the Armenian genocide. <laughs> as you know, he reneged. He refers to it. He doesn't use the G word uh, as president. He refers to it every 24th of April as Medjurgen, the Armenian word that means a great catastrophe to Armenians, but nothing to most Americans. He does uh, say, somewhat elliptically, quote, I've already said what my opinion is on what happened in 1915. It has not changed. So if you want his opinion on what happened, you have to Google his 2008 speech to find his opinion that it was genocide. It's a word he dares not utter for fear of reprisals from Turkey, closing the spy bases of the airfields currently being used by NATO. 
The truth is too inconvenient to utter. Turkey at the moment is simply too important for NATO governments, America and Britain in particular, to utter the G word. In Britain, which was the first to condemn the genocide in 1915 before Raphael Lemkin had even coined the word, Britain, France and Russia declared it a crime against humanity. Actually, the British draft said crime against Christendom, uh, and it was the Russians who pointed out that we weren't all Christians and changed it to crime against humanity. But that was, Britain took the lead in 1915 and actually rounded up some of the perpetrators for trial in Malta until they realized that there was no international criminal law unto which they could be tried. So Britain has a good record, and yet a few years ago, the Foreign Office came up with this appalling uh, formula to state that the evidence is not sufficiently unequivocal. It was a masterpiece of double talk, diplomatic, double speak. The evidence is not sufficiently unequivocal. You can't be a little bit unequivocal. It, made, it was nonsense. And I, in writing, uh, this also stimulated me to take a look at what was behind this change. And I dug up, uh, using our Freedom of Information Act in Britain, uh, some fascinating memoranda to explain it. The memoranda said, Turkey is neuralgic, which is a very good word, neuralgic, it's exactly what it is. On this subject, our present, our formula is unethical. But, I quote, given the importance of our political, strategic, and commercial relations with Turkey, this is the only feasible option. So, there you have a genocide equivocation uh, in the two major nations in NATO. And uh, so that led me as a UN judge, I was president of the UN's War Crimes Court in Sierra Leone, to apply the law of genocide to the facts that are agreed by historians. And my conclusion beyond any doubt is that the Armenian people were victims in 1915 of what is today defined as genocide, defined by the Genocide Convention, defined by the statute of the International Criminal Court, and by its case law. Now, I'm not going to sadden you by repeating in any detail the evidence, the Euphrates River so swollen with dead bodies that it changed its course the beheading of boys, the selling into sexual slavery of the girls, the forced conversions to Islam, and so on. The Armenian minority in the Ottoman Empire had always been denied civil rights, regarded as inferior. The first massacres came in, 19, in 1894. 200,000 were killed until 1896 which was warning enough to the young Turk government when it took over in 1909 of the tinderbox, the racial and religious tinderbox uh, that they had to be careful about. The anti-Armenian feeling, very much like the feeling against the Jews, was because the Armenians were successful. They had, su they had very successful schools, very good schools, Christian schools at the end of the 19th century, and they had succeeded in medicine, in law. Uh, and of course, that uh, created enmity, envy. Uh, the Sultan became, as described by William Gladstone, the bloody assassin who was so hostile to Armenians that he wouldn't allow the word to be used in newspapers. And as the young Turk government, which had originally come to power as progressives. They had the support of the Dashnak MPs in 1909, but like a lot of weak governments, went for nationalism in order to increase their popularity. They developed a Turkification program in which uh, 
the Turks were regarded as racially superior. They demeaned the Greeks, the Armenians, and the Syrians as uh, the Armenians, they called tubercular microbes on the body politic. They changed the street names from Christian to Muslim names. And the name Armenian was banned from companies and couldn't be used in the, the companies or associations, and they refused to allow Armenian, the language, to be taught in schools. And uh, even at the outset of war, they decided to declare war uh, <clears throat> against the Allies and on the side of Germany is very opportunistically. They didn't believe in uh, the, the particularly uh, in it, but they hoped, they believed that the Germans would win. That was their assessment in 1914, and so they entered the war on the side of the Germans. But when they got their tame imam, to issue a fatwa, and he did, against all Christians, he had to add a codicil to it saying, excluding Germans. So that was how they entered the war, and then with the boats off the Dardanelles, they began the roundup of the intellectuals, putting men in army labor battalions and massacring them, and beginning with the deportation laws. Now, the deportation laws talked of, as the Turkish government website talks even today, uh, not of deportation, although that's the translation of the law, but merely of relocation. Relocation to the Syrian desert en route. The majority of them died en route from no medicine, lack of food, or marauding uh, bands of Kurds. And, uh, or they died in the concentration camps beyond Aleppo from typhus and dysentery. And then came the laws that expropriated their property as abandoned, which was another euphemism for confiscation. And it's very interesting to compare the Adolf Eichmann's minute of the Wannsee Conference, which was, as it were, the blueprint for this destruction of the Jews, and the, the language that's used even today on the Turkish government website. This idea, they talked of the evacuation of the Jews uh, to the East uh, because of wartime necessity, just as the young Turk government talked of relocating the Armenians because of wartime necessity. As both governments knew they were being transported. The Armenians, mainly on foot, transported to their deaths. So in, in the use of these genocide euphemisms, it really was pioneered by the young Turks and their German government advisors. The evidence of the government's genocidal intentions comes from many sources. Most compellingly, from their allies, the Germans. The consuls in Constantinople reported regularly to Berlin that Talat and the Young Turks were bent on extinguishing the race. They were very worried that Germany would be complicit in what the allies were calling a crime against humanity. And they urged the Chancellor, Bethmann Holwein, to, uh, and the Kaiser, to disassociate from what was happening to the Armenians. They refused. It's unheard of to criticize your ally in the middle of a war, said the Kaiser in a note. Uh, the American diplomats, of course, were neutral at this stage. And they were appalled, especially at Talat Pasha, who made no bones about his determination to destroy the race. The, uh, we're, we're solving the Armenian question, he said to Morgenthau, by eliminating the Armenians. And of course, there's overwhelming evidence from German and American missionaries, from Austrian and Italian diplomats, captured soldiers, British and Australian soldiers, who were treated 
quite reasonably by the Turks, wrote home, and I've seen their letters in, in war museums in both Australia and in London, so, commenting on the fact that they were being treated fairly, but they couldn't believe their eyes when they saw columns of Armenians uh, being lined up and shot uh, or sent into the desert. And uh, I think, Hannibal, you mentioned the Harbord report. General Harbord, an American, very good uh, American general. Uh, they're not all that way. But uh, he uh, went in 1919 with 30 experts. And they inspected mass graves. And they conducted interviews for a month. And his conclusion at the end was that this was, I quote, the most colossal crime of all the ages, this wholesale attempt on a race. And I think that's a very good description of genocide, the wholesale attempt on a race. And that's, that's genocide in my book, and it's genocide, of course, in the mind of Raphael Lemkin, the brilliant Polish law professor who coined the word and the concept. He was very bothered by the fact that uh, there was no international criminal law at this point that would allow perpetrators to be punished. The British had taken 68 young Turk perpetrators to Malta. They tried to put them on trial, but uh, they realized that as the law then stood, it wasn't a crime for a state official to kill vast numbers of, of their own subjects if that was ordered by their government. We were still on the Machiavellian, Westphalian principle that states and princes had entire sovereignty over their own people. And uh, so there was no international criminal law. If you look at the Turkish government website, uh, you'll see the claim that the Turks were innocent of genocide because the British uh, took them to Malta and they were all found to be innocent. Uh, this is a complete lie, but it's one of many that is uh, sadly and surprisingly uh, made on the Turkish government website. In fact, the main perpetrators, uh, Talat and Enver, uh, were given asylum by the Germans. They took them away in in gunboats, and they tell out was living happily not quite ever after in Berlin until he was assassinated by a vigilante who had lost his entire family on the death march of seeing his father killed in front of his eyes. And he was put on trial, and uh, it was an amazing trial because uh, Lepsius, who was an enormously courageous German missionary, uh, told the jury about the Armenian genocide and uh, General Lyman von Sanders, who had actually been mainly responsible, not Ataturk, for the victory at the Dardanelles because he was the commanding German officer who had uh, set up all the sites that machine gunned the Allies uh, when they landed. He too gave evidence of the atrocities that he said he had tried to stop but couldn't. And uh, the German jury acquitted the assassin of Talat on the basis that his mind had been traumatized by the loss of his family. And this really worried Lemkin because he said, well, you, we can't leave mass murder of a country's own subjects to the justice of the vigilante." It should be made an international crime. And he went right back to the destruction of Carthage. And he looked at the way racial and religious hatreds have fanned massacres. And of course, it was said, uh, it was said by the Pope that the Armenian genocide is the first genocide of the 20th century. Well, the Pope is not infallible. Uh, it wasn't. The first genocide was the destruction of the Herero people, the Hottentots, in 1905 by the Germans, led initially by Hermann Goering's grandfather. And those, seriously, 
those German generals uh, who had massacred the Hottentots went on to advise the Turks. German complicity is one of very interesting uh, areas that hasn't fully been explored and then went on to play an important part in Hitler's army. So Lemkin uh, had always used the Armenian genocide as the latest and the worst example of the need for an international criminal law and of course uh, eventually uh, there was an even worse example, the Nazi genocide and it was he in 1944 who coined the word genocide as the worst of all crimes against humanity and it became a of course it, the genocide convention was passed in 1948 and the American government in its address to the International Court of Justice in 1951 uh, described the Armenian genocide as a classic example of genocide. The genocide convention is very important not least because America has ratified it. The ratification came with Ronald Reagan in 1986. There's uh, an interesting story, some of you may remember, that Ronald Reagan was going ill-advisedly to Bitburg Cemetery where there were SS graves. And uh, a fat-bearded, obese young protester from Flint, Michigan, uh, found this out and he and a friend went over and held up their banners uh, as Reagan entered saying uh, the pre US president honors SS killers and uh, it caused such uh, a fury among the Jewish lobby that when Reagan got back three weeks later he ratified the genocide convention and the young bearded protester from Flint, Michigan was of course Michael Moore making his most successful protest but uh, so it is important to understand that under the Genocide Convention, you don't have to kill the whole race to be guilty of genocide. Uh, President Erdogan keeps saying, well, it couldn't have been genocide because there are still Armenians living in Turkey. Uh, that is uh, entirely wrong. You have to kill, be out to kill, I think a significant proportion. Uh, I, um, sometimes the ICJ suggests it's a substantial proportion. But uh, in a very important decision, the International Court of Justice ruled that the killings at Srebrenica were genocide. 7,000 Muslim men and boys were killed, 18,000 women and children deport deported, and that was a, amounted to genocide. And indeed, the Genocide Convention says that genocide is committed by deliberately inflicting on the racial or religious group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. And that is exactly what happened to the Armenians in 1915. But uh, why does Turkey dispute it? Well, Turkey says, uh, leaving aside President uh, Dogan's uh, ignorant comment about there still being Armenians in Turkey. Um, it says, well, <laughs> our records show that there were, we only counted 1.1 million Armenians in the Ottoman Empire and we only killed 600,000. Seriously, that is what is said on the Turkish government website. It, they couldn't, we couldn't have killed 1.5 million, as the Armenians say, because there weren't that number in Turkey. Well, in, in, in the Ottoman Empire. Now, demographers uh, are always difficult to understand, and they don't have the records. But there is no doubt that the Armenian church records, which I think in those crowded tenements in Western Armenia, in 1915 are probably are much more reliable than state census and they count 
2.2 million. So uh, I don't think that the, uh, and it's interesting that when the German politicians go to, um, uh, to, to the Ottoman Empire in 1915, they are told uh, the figure of 1.5 million deaths. So I think we can say confidently at least a million. But whether it's 600,000 of 1.1 million, or whether it's 1.5 million of 2.2 million, doesn't matter on any view. A substant more than half the Armenian race have been destroyed on the Turkish government's own admission. Then, of course, the major defense is that these relocations as they euphemistically call them, were needed because of military necessity. Well, that does not excuse the massacres. Necessity in war, even in war, can never justify the deliberate killing of civilians. If you think that a particular racial group is likely to be disloyal, then you can detain its leaders. The Dashnak leaders could have been detained, they could have been interned, they could have been prosecuted. But you don't send small children and women and old men on long marches without food and medicine from which they're not expected to return. The, uh, uh, the argument which is being promoted by, with a massive PR exercise in the run-up to the centenary is actually very dangerous. Deliberately killing civilians can never be justified in order to gain a military advantage. There were, admittedly, dangers on the Russian front, and there were some Armenians who defected to the Russian army, and there was that outbreak of violence from Armenians in Van. And uh, they succeeded in driving out the Turkish army, but only for two months. The Turks came back with a vengeance after two months. And the danger of giving any legal credence to the Turkish argument of military necessity is uh, because the Turks say, oh, look, we've got to confine genocide to the Holocaust because there uh, the Jews were killed and they didn't resist. But if there is any civil resistance, and there was some from the Dashnaks, then we can uh, say that it was a civil war and not a genocide. Well, that would justify Raj Kapaska in Sri Lanka killing up to 70,000 civilians in order to eliminate the Tamil Tigers it was an argument that could be used by the Pakistani army to justify the killing of three million Bengalis back in 1971 because they harbored a small number of freedom fighters. It is during war that the law of genocide is most necessary to protect minority groups. And it is ironic that the Turkish government denies genocide on the pretext that the Armenians were the enemy within during a war. The, that's the very circumstance in which there is a special obligation on a state to protect racial and religious groups. And so much for military necessity. It wasn't militarily necessary to cleanse uh, Western Armenia. It fell, the Russians, walked through it in 1916 and 1917. Uh, and of course, where Turkey was successful, at the Dardanelles on that front, uh, there were few of any Armenians. So what are we to make of this massively funded Turkish government denialism of any crime committed by its predecessors in 1915. It goes beyond denialism because under section 301 of the Turkish Criminal Code, citizens can be, and very often are, prosecuted for asserting that there was a genocide. Haran Dink, who was a courageous newspaper editor in Turkey, was actually assassinated and the government did nothing 
to bring his assassins to justice. School children are taught to write essays refuting the genocide. The press restrictions are such that Turkey is now rated 154 in lead tables of press freedom, largely because of this ban on Ottoman behavior. If you say there was a genocide in Turkey, you run the risk of being prosecuted under section 301 for insulting Turkishness. Well, it was all a long time ago, but a hundred years is still within living memory. I think the year before last, President Obama invited to tea a lady who was 103 and had survived the death march. Uh, she was invited to tea at the White House along with the world's most famous Armenian, uh, Kim Kardashian. <laughs> but, uh, of course, the mental scars, the psychological trauma on children and grandchildren continues throughout the diaspora and will continue until Turkey makes some acknowledgement of the crime and some reparation. International law is providing, I think, or capable of providing some assistance, the Nazi uh, assets that were paintings and so on that were stolen by Goering are being returned and uh, there are assets expropriated in 1915 that can still be traced. Over 2,000 churches were seized. Some can be given back. There was one at Lake Van, which was uh, restored a few years ago with a great uh, fuss by the Turks, and then they refused to allow it to be used as a church. They would only give a permit for it to be used as a museum. Uh, Armenians want their historic lands returned, Western Armenia, which may be asking too much, although I've suggested that the majestic and mysterious Mount Ararat that overlooks Yerevan uh, could be returned as an act of reconciliation. Uh, I think it's probably too loaded with electronic communications. Uh, <laughs> probably most of them uh, run by the CIA to uh, allow it to be, uh, to be returned, but it would be a wonderful and symbolic act. Uh, what I think Armenians can most ask for, and I, I go back to my own relatives killed at Gallipoli, and I don't think, uh, and, and the difference is, of course, that they need and should have reparation for an international crime. What they want firstly is acknowledgement of that crime because the denial of genocide in, in effect is the ultimate in genocide, is the final act of the genocide uh, denying it. Uh, even if Turkey were to choke on the G word, there must from President Erdogan on the 24th of April be uh, an acceptance that the Ottoman Empire committed a crime against humanity. What the Turks have done, it's very interesting, they have um, I've been surprised up to a point that they haven't sought to argue against the force of the law set out in my book. They haven't uh, presented their paid uh, propagandist professors um, from the Ataturk chair at Princeton and other such uh, unbiased places to uh, put up again, what they've done is to have a massive event that they hope will drown out the uh, remembrance of the Armenian genocide on the 24th and 25th of April. They've invited every world leader and uh, some, including Prince Charles and his sons are going, the Prime Ministers of uh, Australia and New Zealand, possibly of Britain, although I think he's too involved in the election campaign, uh, will go to Gallipoli. And so there will be a diversion, a massive diversion. That is the Turkish hope that they can avoid any mention of the Armenian genocide 
because they will have this massive diversionary ceremony at Gallipoli. They, they always um, had their remembrance of Gallipoli on the 18th of March, which is when they started fortifying the Dardanelles. But for this year, they've moved it to uh, the 24th of April in the hope that, uh, of drowning out the noise from Yerevan. But uh, what should happen is a recognition by President Erdogan of at least a crime against humanity, genocide, of course, being the worst. And there's no conceivable legal argument that uh, what happened, the massacres and deportations, did not amount to that. And uh, Turkey must drop its outrageous claim that the 1915 events did not amount to genocide and amounted to nothing at all, as if military necessity can justify the marching of hundreds of thousands, whether it's 600,000 or 800,000, as the Turks accept, uh, of civilians to their death. That this is a war crime of utmost gravity was confirmed by the American military courts and the Australian military courts, which convicted Japanese generals for the death marches in the Philippines. Uh, their victims, of course, were soldiers who were prisoners of war. That to subject civilians to the same treatment is a crime that military necessity can never justify any more than it could justify General Maladic's destruction of Muslims in Srebrenica on the ground of strategic advantage for his army and its cause. Genocide because it's the worst crime against humanity, calls for special study of its causes and special precautions against its recurrence. There are lessons to be learnt from the way that the new and seemingly progressive young Turk government decided to solidify its support behind the banner of racial superiority and how this in turn led intellectual theorists to demonize and dehumanize minorities from other races. First, they came for the Greeks, and they killed some of them, but there was a country they could deport them to, namely Greece. Then they came for the Armenians and killed most of them, and then they came for the Assyrians and killed about 290,000 out of 600,000. Genocide scholarship, looking closely analyzing these events serves a valuable purpose by identifying patterns that recur in the build-up to behavior in which formerly happy neighbors can be incited to hack each other to death and to renounce the very notion of neighborhood as a living space which human beings of different creeds and colors can amicably occupy. Within living memory, Murderous race hatred has been inflicted on the Hindus and Bengalis of Bangladesh, on the Tutsis in Rwanda, the Muslims of Bosnia-Herzegovina, the Tamils of Sri Lanka, the Chechens in Russia, the Mayans in Guatemala, the Chinese in Indonesia, the Darfurians in Sudan, and on other victim groups, including the Coptic Christians and the Yazidi Christians uh, being attacked by ISIS. The list is long and it will lengthen unless the world no, now remembers the Armenians and rejects the claim that their killing was no more than cruel necessity. Genocide deniers and genocide equivocators, the American government and the British government and the Australian government, will say on April the 24th this year, that what happened on April the 24th and afterwards in 1915 was a tragedy. It was not a tragedy, it was a crime. The worst crime of all, the crime of genocide. <laughs>